You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I chat with Casey Franchini to learn about how she was able to get started in real estate with no money, two kids, all while being a full time mom. Casey is the founder of Brick by Brick Wealth, a former broker turned successful real estate investor and a mom to three kids. As the host, when I go into an episode recording with someone new that I haven't met before, I never really know what to expect. As with every other episode, it was the same with this episode with Casey, but it turns out we actually think about and approach real estate very similarly and have a lot of the same beliefs on the best ways to invest. It was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed it, and I think you guys will learn a lot from it as well. So let's get right into this week's episode with Casey Franchini. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Casey Franchini. Welcome to the show, Casey. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to be on your show today. Tell us a bit about yourself. Give us your story on how you got to where you are today. So, I mean, this is a real estate show, so uh, I've got a lot of parts of my life. But as far as the real estate aspect, I have been in love with just houses ever since I was a little girl. I would go with my parents to open houses. My dad bought an extreme fixer upper that we moved into when I was in like eighth grade. So for the next 10 years of my life, until I went to college, I was living in a house that was always under construction. So (laughs) I learned to love rehab and going to Home Depot and Lowe's. Mostly it was Home Depot at the time. And when I graduated college, I got a real job. You know, I went to college and I got a job in public relations. So I got my hour and a half job driving down towards the beach. And it just was overwhelming the amount of time that I was not enjoying my life working somewhere else. And in California, it's um, commute time is killer. So I hated it. And luckily, I mean, I say this, that sounds bad, but the company closed down. The owner did some not so great things in his personal life. So it was a great opportunity for me to reevaluate what I wanted to do in my life. And do I really want to continue on this path of working you know, nine to six and not getting home until 7.30 at night. And I said, no, I don't think I want to do public relations anymore. I think I want to do what I always loved, which was real estate. I would love to be a real estate agent. And this was back then, 2007, right when the bubble was bursting during the Great Recession. And I said, okay, well, I'm still going to do it anyways. So I became a real estate agent. And it was terrible. It was a very terrible experience trying to list properties in Orange County which is very affluent and expensive. And all of the the people that owned houses there had million dollar homes and they didn't want to list it with a girl who looked 12. I look young now. I really looked young then. So it was a challenge to get some decent listings. But so where I found my niche was finding flips for real estate investors. Because you know they'll take anyone who wants to find them a house. They're like, sure, girl, you want to go drive to the desert and uh, look at these houses and see if they're any good? You go for that. So I did. I was driving and using my gas all around California, SoCal, going to the desert, even beach areas for flips, uh, downtown Los Angeles, deep inland empire. And I was doing pretty good. And I was finding good flip investment properties for investors. And it was amazing. And I loved it. And I saw what real estate could do. And my dad and I tried flipping a house and we didn't get past the inspection period. And we said, never mind, this is too risky. And we didn't know what we were doing really. And so... um, We didn't do it. But so then I got married and we moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and my eyes just were blown. I thought, oh my gosh, this is a gold mine in Memphis. You can buy a house for $10,000. We're going to be rich. I'm going to buy every house on the block. You know, I'm going to own 100 houses in no time, cash flowing. And I knew they made money, right? Because I did my analysis. But then when I went to go look at the houses or look, drive down the streets, I was like, never mind. (laughs) I don't think I really want to buy those $10,000 houses in those neighborhoods. So we thought a little more practical and we thought, well, what do we really want to get out of rental properties? Well, what we really want is to make it easy. My husband still had his W-2. I had three kids at home. Well, I guess actually we only have two kids when we started. Now I have three. 
we had two kids and I didn't want to go to work. So I wanted to be able to do everything on my own. I wanted to manage the properties myself. We like to do rehab. My husband's just like my dad in that aspect. So we have every tool known to man. There's no cars that fit in our garage. (laughs) It's all tools. And so we started by good rental properties in B and strong C-class neighborhoods. And that's how we got started. And we try and buy one or two a year. As you think back on how having your real estate license has impacted you as an investor, do you recommend new investors listening to the show today get their license? Do you think it'll help them be more successful investors? No, I don't think so. I mean, I learned a lot. I'll tell you this. I learned a lot doing real estate, you know, selling houses and whatnot. But it's different when you're buying an investment property. It's not the same. You don't look at real estate the same. You don't look at properties the same. And it's a completely different process, in my opinion. Yeah, it helps you if you're going to do a lot of flips and you want to save on commission. That will definitely help you to have a real estate license. And I'm sure it helped me you know, get the jump and feel confident in my decisions. But I still wasn't super confident. I still had who I call my mentor kind of help me through our first couple of properties. And when I was out looking for my first rental property, I said, well, I need someone to guide me in the right direction because real estate, buying a rental property is, you know, it's a, it is a risk. Yeah, real estate is safe overall, but you don't want to buy the wrong property. You don't want to buy in the wrong neighborhood. What if you're not sure on what the rents really are? What if you're not putting the right tenant in place and you don't do all the right things? It's hard for people that have never done that before to make the right decision. So I called up actually the house we bought in Memphis, our primary residence. It was the listing agent to my primary who I knew they owned rental properties. So a few years later, I called her up and I said, Hey, I don't know if you remember me, but we kind of bought the house you listed a while back. I remember you guys said you owned rental properties. And would you be interested in helping me get my first rental property? And she's like, Oh, my husband kind of does all that. I just sell residential to regular home buyers. And so I talked to him and he was just the best guy ever. And if I hadn't had his guidance on my first couple of properties, I probably wouldn't have pulled the trigger and actually bought something because he was there to tell me, even as a real estate agent, I mean, I knew the numbers, I knew my comps, I knew I wanted to do it, but just for someone to say, yes, this is a good investment. I invest in this neighborhood too. And I would buy it if I were you. You know, I wouldn't worry about these minor things you're complaining about. We probably would have bought one, but it might not have been as soon as we did. So as far as having a real estate license, I had mine and I still didn't feel confident to make those decisions because it's just not the same. Has having your license hurt you as an investor at all? I don't think so. There's, I mean, a lot of real estate agents have their licenses. A lot of them. A lot of real estate agents own rental properties, especially in these markets that I live in. Now in California, when I was having a hard time finding rental properties, when I was looking, uh, we had to go out far because I was in Orange County and there's no good rentals there. That doesn't make sense. I was looking out Fontana and Deep Inland Empire and towards the desert and stuff back then when it made sense. Those properties now are 400,000 when they were like 150 before, which beating myself up that I didn't buy those dang houses. But I don't think that it really helps to have your license and it doesn't hurt it either. The only way it would really help is that you have access to the MLS and getting your own comps. But to me, that's the number one advantage. You don't have to wait for a real estate agent to let you in the house. You can go get your own house. I still have my broker license for California. So I can get referrals on my own properties, referral fees. So if I go buy a house in Memphis, I have since I have my California broker license, not a real estate salesperson, but a broker license, I can get a referral fee on my own property that I buy. So I do keep that active so I can get referral fees out of state. So it doesn't really I don't know, behoove me to get my license out here. I just rather let some other agent do all the work and write in the offers. I'm not sure if it varies state to state, but I actually, I'm licensed as well. I don't use it. I, I don't practice or sell any houses or help anybody buy houses, but I use it for that exact same thing. I use a referral commission. I'm not a broker. I just have my salesperson license, but I am able to still earn referral commissions for other people, but also myself when I buy my rentals or even when I buy my own primary residence or sell my own residences as well. So I keep mine active for that same reason. So do I. Mine's been active for since 2007. It's not that hard. Just do some continuing education every five years and pay the small fee and it's totally worth it. When you were a new young agent that was struggling to get those million dollar listings, you started to focus on helping investors with a couple of specific strategies and types of properties. I want to talk about those specifically and define them for everyone listening in case they haven't heard of them before or they just don't know exactly what they are. The first one is short sales. What is a short sale and why might an investor be interested in them? Well, a short sale is when the owner of the property 
they're making payments, but their, their house isn't worth the mortgage anymore. So for example, like in 2007, these were really, you know, 2007, eight, nine, these were really popular when the property, let's say they bought it for, let's just give an easy number, $100,000, but now it's only worth $50,000 and they're still making their mortgage payments. Like, why am I paying for this $100,000 loan You know, when it's only worth 50,000? So the homeowner would ask the bank to, if they could sell, if the homeowner would ask the bank, if they could sell it to somebody else at a loss to the bank. And a lot of times a bank's going to say, yeah, sure. Okay. Why would the bank say that? That or you say, forget it. I'm not making this ridiculous payment because the property's not worth it. And so it's going to foreclose anyway. And then if your house forecloses, then it's going to be in need of repairs. People don't take care of the property. It's worth less than it is now. And it's less work for the bank. The banks, they don't want to foreclose on you. They don't want to own properties. They'd rather someone just pay something on it. So why are those types of properties interesting for investors to buy? Because there's always a motivation for somebody to get out of a property. There's you got to find out what's their crutch. What are they wanting to get out of it? You know, and a lot of people, if the investor can wait, see a lot of homeowners who are looking to move into properties for their own personal life, they usually have a time frame. Like I've got to sell this house to move into this house, or I'm looking to move in by the summer before school starts, or whatever. But investors, there's not really a time frame. So that's a plus that they have on their side. They can be in a short sale for three or four or five months because those properties, short sales were taking a very long time back then. There aren't a lot of short sales now. So from my experience back then, short sales were a very long drawn out process. And you could be tied up as a buyer for one certain property for four or five months. And then what if it never goes through? The bank's not going to tell you. They're not going to promise you the short sale until you bring them an offer in the first place. And then it goes through the process and then they approve the short sale, which could be months. So a potential buyer who's looking to buy for their own family, for their own house, could be on the hook waiting around for a property they may never get. So they're not very appealing to the regular homeowner who's looking to buy a property. But for the investor, they don't care. They can buy multiple properties at a time. So if it takes four or five months to get the deal through, they don't care. It's fine. Another type of strategy or property you helped investors with was expired listings. What's an expired listing and why are those good for investors? An expired listing is when a homeowner lists their property for sale with a real estate agent and the contract between them and the real estate agent is usually six months, three, six months. That's the average time for a listing. And if the agent doesn't sell their house in time, then the contract expires. And now the homeowner is free to go find another agent or just decide, never mind, I don't want to sell my house. So the listing has expired. And it goes in the MLS as an expired listing. It went someone who wanted to sell their house, but for whatever reason, it didn't sell. So investors and other people who are looking to pick up properties at a discount can contact those expired listings, contact the sellers and say, Hey, you know, you, I saw you tried to list your house last year, but didn't work out. Um, are you still interested in selling? And there could be a myriad of reasons why their house didn't sell or it didn't work out for them. But it's a great time for the investors to scoop in and get at even a lower price. Because most times sellers think, my house wasn't worth it. Nobody wants to buy my house. Something's wrong with it. Or maybe it costs too much. Maybe I, I really was asking too much money. And so the investors can then come in, be in with no competition and offer a lower price and get the property under contract. How about an REO? Explain to us what an REO is and how investors benefit from those. So REO listings are real estate owned. That means that a property has gone through foreclosure already and it went on the auction steps and nobody bought it. So nobody bought it. The bank gets it back, but the bank doesn't want to own real estate, doesn't want to own houses. So it hires these real estate agents to work under them. And basically, if you are a real estate agent and you are an REO agent, you're basically set. Like Everybody wants to be an REO agent because the banks will just give chunks of like 10, 12, 15 listings to an agent at one time. And it's like money, right? Because you want the listing contract. So the listing agent, a regular old real estate agent who kind of works with the bank, the bank likes this girl or guy that's a realtor. So they give them all their listings from the bank. Then that real estate agent puts it on the MLS and it's listed as an REO, which was an old foreclosure that, did, that no one scooped up at auction. So those properties likely have, uh, they need a lot of work. They, because they've been vacant. And you know, people that are in foreclosure, they can't afford their mortgage, which means they can't afford to make repairs on the property. There's a lot of deferred maintenance. The houses look really bad. They probably have had a really poor standard of living inside for a long time before the bank actually was able to foreclose 
also means there's back taxes and all sorts of things that weren't paid on the property. So usually foreclosures and REOs are not in that great a shape. But nowadays, banks have gotten a little savvy, I think, as to the value that they can actually get out of these properties. So a lot of banks now, they don't just sell you kind of a piece like a bad house now. Now, banks have their own contractor teams to fix up the house, make it looking pretty good. They'll try and sell you as close to market value property as they can nowadays. So I don't really think that investors have a real big leg up anymore buying REOs now that banks are fixing the houses up themselves and selling them near market value. It used to be that they would because the banks would just relist those foreclosures right back with the, with the real estate agent and they would be in just as bad a condition as they were when they were in foreclosure. But that's not really the case now. I mean, I'm sure some banks just don't fix them up, but a lot of banks now are fixing up the houses so they can get more money back. A lot of people often reach out to me and say that they're struggling to find a deal. For those people or really anyone that's listening who is looking for new ways to acquire properties, you just mentioned that REOs might not be as popular as they once were, but there probably are still some banks that are just selling them as they are. So do you think these three strategies that we just walked through are still applicable to new investors even in today's market 13 years later after you were helping investors with them? I do. I think that a lot of strategies have changed. There's not as many short sales right now. There aren't as many foreclosures right now. So getting a short sale, getting you know an REO, there's, they're kind of few and far between. There's not a lot right now out there. I feel like there's a few other strategies that people have been using in today's times that are a little more successful and with more opportunity. There's a lot of speculation that Banks aren't foreclosing right now. So there's a lot of speculation that there's going to be some foreclosures coming once that is lifted and banks can do foreclosures again. So is now possibly a good time for people to really study these three strategies of short sales, expired listings, and REOs to really understand them so that when that does happen, maybe they could then take advantage of it? I think I do think so. I think that short sales are a really good option for the real estate investor because a lot of people that are buying, like I said, for their own home. They aren't willing to wait four or five months for a short sale to go through. Um, short sales have gotten faster, but there's still a lot of red tape and they're not as uh, smooth as just buying a regular 20% down regular old house. When you're buying a, a short sale or foreclosure, a lot of other stuff goes into it. You're dealing with, with banks and issues. And so I think that investors that are willing to be a little more flexible and not be so picky about things and, and have the time and can have be offering on multiple houses at one time would be good for them. I also think that a really important thing to do if you're expecting foreclosures and things to start rolling in would be to be in a really strong cash position. All these properties are going to be gobbled up by the highest and best offers, by the best investors. Everyone and their mother are waiting for foreclosures and they are hoarding their cash because cash offers are king and cash wins. And you get a discount when you buy cash and everybody wants to sell to an all cash investor. But not a lot of people have all cash. So if you're one of those investors that don't have just cash sitting in your bank account, I would recommend to get really familiar with private money lenders, hard money lenders, maybe get some... If you don't have any experience at all, a lot of these lenders won't lend to you a large percentage of what you're wanting if you don't have any experience or have nothing under your belt. So maybe meanwhile, try and get your first rental property, try and get some sort of investor experience so that when the time comes, you'll be able to borrow large sums of money from private money and hard money lenders to be in that all cash position uh, when the time comes. Back in 2013, when your household just had one income coming in, you were taking care of the kids, you didn't have enough money to invest in your first rental. This is a common problem that a lot of people have, and that's not having enough money to buy a deal. Rather than using that as an excuse, you were resourceful and you found a way to make it happen. Walk us through what you did to earn the money for your first rental and how much you needed to save to make that deal happen. So we're really risk averse. We like to do things very safe. I feel like I'll take more risk than my husband will, but he's in charge of the 401ks and all the stock stuff. So I'm the real estate girl. So when I said I wanted to buy real estate and rental properties, he was on board right away. There was no issue there with him getting on board, but it was, how are we going to buy it? We just moved across the country and bought our house that was a complete fixer. And so we've been putting a lot... We're still fixing it. It's almost eight years and we're finally going to do our kitchen. So it's been a lot of, lot of work throughout the years. But with that being said, it's a lot of money out of pocket. We don't do credit card debt or anything like that. So we pay everything as we go. 
So I wanted to buy a rental house, but I wanted 20% down. I don't even think then I even knew. I knew a bigger pockets and books and stuff, but I never read a thing, listened to a thing. I never watched a YouTube video. Only the experience I had was my own experience helping other real estate investors and being a real estate agent. So I said, okay, well, we're going to do it the safe way. And, you know, in my opinion, and we're going to put 20% down. So I needed the money to do that. I, like I said, I had a three week old when we moved here and a two year old. So I wasn't going to go get a job. I didn't uh, have a babysitter. We had no family or friends here. So I thought, well, what can I do at home? Like I have to, there's got to be something I can do that I'm good at. And I thought, well, I like to do crafts. You know, what girl doesn't like crafts? You know, give me some glue sticks and some glitter and I'm in. So I thought, all right, well, I'm not very, my stuff doesn't look good when I do crafts. So what can I do (laughs) that somebody wants to buy? So I bought one of those Cricut machines, like a die cutter. And some people have a silhouette and I I have a Cricut. And I started making, the first things I started making were these little stuffed bunnies for Easter. Now Dollar Tree sells these little bunny rabbits. They're like five inches tall for a dollar, obviously, the Dollar Tree. And I got this glitter t-shirt vinyl and I would personalize the bunnies with these little kids' names and the year. And I would sell them for 5 and $7 on Etsy. I started a little Etsy shop called Namography on Etsy, which I don't, it's not open anymore. I mean, it's there, but I don't sell anything. And also on local Facebook groups and resale sites, people would do porch pickups and pick up like 10 bunnies for their you know, little friends. And, and I started selling personalized stuff, went from t-shirts to bridesmaid gifts, wedding gifts, And I just started, you know, I looked around what was popular and I tried and replicate and make it better. And by about a year and a half, I had saved $20,000. I opened my own checking account at Wells Fargo where we bank. All the money would go into there. All the expenses came out of there. All the money would go into there. And finally, I was like, Blake, we've got enough now for a down payment. So we went and bought our first property with that. And it was really rewarding, you know, because I mean, I had a degree and I wanted to be worth something too. So for the fact that it wasn't just my husband, Blake, that was making all the money, allowing us to buy rental properties and live this great lifestyle. But actually I could provide some value to the family too. And buy our first property, like that was just invaluable. So I, I was proud of myself. I, I still kind of am <laughs> that I did that. Fueled our desire for more houses. I am too, because a lot of people would just say, I don't have enough money. I can't invest in real estate. And they would just use that as an excuse and they would stop there. And you know, you clearly didn't do that. You were very resourceful. And you know, it doesn't really matter what it was that you were selling or what you did. Is It was this fact that you came up with something creative and made it happen. And I have a two and a half year old son as well. So I know being a parent, it's not easy to do anything while you have your kids. So I can only imagine you know, a big kudos to you as to what, what you were doing in terms of trying to come up with the income to buy your first rental while also parenting your children. So I know it's definitely not easy. I was working you know, upstairs in my craft room, now my little real estate room. I've changed it around. But during nap times, you know, and my I had a three week old, two year old. So one would take more naps than the other. One would take longer naps than the other. So one would get to watch some Peppa Pig while I'm upstairs for two hours. You know, I'm hate to say it, but it wasn't all the time. Or after work when Blake got home or on weekends. And then it started off being one day a week. And then it was like, oh, I've got more business two days a week. And then it started being three days a week. And my mother in law finally uh, moved down here from California to be by us. And so she was helping me watch, watch my kids one day a week for me or, one and a half days or come over during nap time so I could make my sales. I had sales on Etsy I had to complete. So it was rewarding. I really liked it a lot. And it gave me, a, gave me some money for my first property. You mentioned that you put about $20,000 into that first property. Doing some calculations in my head and backing into what that probably means, you probably had to put 20, 25% down on the property. So we're probably looking at eighty to $100,000 property. Is that the type of property you bought? Yeah, we bought a house for 92 and we put 20% down. So we had, you know, we had more money besides just my Etsy thing, but that was the bulk of it, you know, went towards that. So we bought a property for 92,000. It was in East Memphis, B class neighborhood, great, like desirable schools. I was scared for the first one. I didn't want to be in too dodgy of an area because it was my first house and I didn't want it to ruin my excitement for rental properties. And I wanted, you know, I feel like the first one is the most important because. If you mess up on the first one, you're going to be like, screw this. Like, I don't want to do this ever again. But if you can get a successful first one, then it's like, all right, now I'm um, all bets are off, unlimited. The game is on. Like, what can I get next? You know, but so I feel like the first one is so important to get right. I wanted to make sure we were in a solid neighborhood. So we went into a B-class neighborhood and we fixed it up ourselves. Didn't need a lot. We just scraped ceilings. Like, I wouldn't recommend doing that for rentals anymore. 
But that's like overkill. But we fixed it up a little bit and we got on, you know, on the market for rent and it rents now for eleven fifty a month. And that's still under market. I know looking at comps now, we could probably get fourteen hundred for it. So when the tenant moves out, we'll probably put throw in a granite countertop and ask fourteen or fourteen fifty. And I'm pretty sure now it's probably worth uh, probably one ninety already. Gone up a lot in the past few years. I love what you mentioned first before you mentioned what the property was because I actually I talk about that a lot here on the show. I always say that it's kind of one of my guiding principles for real estate, and also when I help new investors or newer than me is you know I tell them you don't need a huge deal for your first deal. And you often hear on the internet, you know, all these gurus say, go as big as you can, as soon as you can. You know, I wish I had started bigger sooner. And I understand that rationale. But for me, I actually think starting small is the best thing a new investor can do because exactly what you said is if it goes wrong, you have a much smaller hole or a much smaller loss if you're just doing a small single family house that's worth seventy five hundred thousand rather than buying a fifty unit apartment building. If that goes south, you're digging yourself a really really big hole that you're going to have to get out of. And you probably never will. And you probably will never actually become an investor. I agree. I totally agree with you on that. I tell everybody, you know, I try and preach, get your first rental property. It will set you up for success. And people come to me and they ask me all the time, should I do the burn method? I want to scale to 10 properties in the first year. I'm like, all right, take it down a notch. All great ambitions. But let's worry about your first one. Let's get into a safe area. You don't want to buy the cheapest house. You don't want to buy a house that's had electrical fire. You don't want to buy a house that's falling off a hill. Like just because you can do the burn method on it, like hold up. Like I'm very risk averse, and I feel like people should understand all the steps of the process and know what's coming, so that when they do a big job like a burr or something with big rehabs, they all they need to focus on are repairs, rehab costs, timeline, and getting that down really well, and not have to worry about oh, so what happens during the inspection period. When do I get paid out from my hard money lender? Or it's just like all those little things. You don't realize how much you need to know to buy a first property and all that goes with it. So I feel like the simplest way to go would be the safest and easiest way just to learn the process and the steps and then go crazy after that. Explain to us what the Burr method is for those listening that haven't heard that before. The Burr method, you know, is popular, coined by Brandon Turner at Bigger Pockets and It's buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. So everyone can look up kind of what the Burr method is, but I'd like to say what exactly, how I feel the Burr method can be successful for those that are have been seeing this unicorn way to just get rich in real estate, which it is, but you got to do it right. And from in my opinion, this is how you do it right. First of all, if you're going to buy a Burr property, you need to buy one significantly undervalued. That currently, in its current state, in its current messed up state, significantly undervalued. Secondly, you have to buy one that needs so much work that it won't qualify for conventional financing because otherwise you're going to be competing with way too many people. You don't want to have a lot of competition. So you want one that's really messed up, already underpriced, and one that you can, that the ARV or after repair value, the market value after it's all fixed up and pretty and 100% rehabbed and complete is really well. It's amazing in the neighborhood. So you want to have a big spread in between of what it costs now. Let's say you buy a house that's $80,000. You need, you know, I don't know, 50 to fix it up or whatever. And then afterwards, it'll be worth 250 or 275. Like that's what you're looking for. Something really cheap. Secondly, or thirdly, or whatever number I'm on, you need to buy the property with all cash to get the deal. So you won't be financing a bird property. There, no one's going to give you a loan on a house that's been half burned down or you know, missing an entire kitchen or all the copper has been pulled out and there's no appliances and it's been vacant for six months. You won't get a lender to finance you on that. So you're going to have to pay all cash, which means if you don't have all cash, then you have to get in touch with a hard money or a private money lender to loan you the money so you can be an all cash borrower which means then you have to pay interest every month until your property has been rented to pay interest to the person you're borrowing from every month while you're fixing it up, right? And you got to fix it up. And then you have to put a tenant in place once it's all done for six to 12 months. So you're still paying your hard money lender if you can't pay him back that entire time, because it will be six to 12 months before a regular bank will then do you a cash out refinance, which is different from a regular refinance. So a cash out refinance is where 
you own a property free and clear, you have no loan. Let's say you own it for $200,000 or a hundred thousand. I like a hundred thousand. It's an easier number. I'm not a math whiz. A hundred thousand dollars and you own it free and clear and you want the money out. You want to now have a 30 year 80, 20 loan. And so that an 80, 20 loan means 20% in the property, 80% in your pocket. So that means that they're going to give you $80,000 check. They're going to give you a a suitcase basically with $80,000 in it. And they're going to say, here you go. Now you owe us a monthly mortgage payment. So that's the cash that we finance. So the point of the Burr method is to buy something severely undervalued with hardly any money, whether it's hardly any of your own money because you borrowed from other people or whatever the case is. The point is to get at a really cheap deal, fix it up really nice, have an amazing comps and get an amazing after repair value and appraisal value so that you can do a cash out refinance for that big and final number. And then you get all your money back and you can go do it all over again somewhere else. So basically you're reusing the same down payment over and over if done correctly. This is a strategy that I've, I've known of for probably a year or two now. I hadn't implemented it yet, but I'm actually doing my first burr right now. And it's interesting because it, I'm kind of coupling what we talked about before in terms of starting small and getting an easy win with the Burr strategy. Rather than I've never flipped a property. I've only done rentals and house hacks. So rather than buying one that's fully needs a full gut, I bought one with my business partner that just needs a little bit of work. Doesn't need anything super crazy. And we're not going to get all our money back. We know that because it's not a full rehab. And you know, typically for those listening, the more you do in terms of rehab, the more money you can get out. We knew that going in, we're we're not doing a full gut. It's just some minor things. So we're probably going to leave about five thousand dollars in the deal. Whereas if we just bought this as a move-in ready, we probably would leave about seventeen to 20000 So it's still significantly better than it could have been. And for us, we're just super excited about it because we're going to be able to get that and we'll hopefully get that, that win notched in our belt. And then you know the next one, maybe we'll do a little bit more repairs. And the next one, we'll do a little bit more repairs and maybe get all our money back. But even if we could continue to just do light rehabs with $5,000 in a deal, that's great. I mean, $5,000 to buy a rental is, is great. I love it. That's my jam. I do. I, I, when I get the messages, people you know, don't know anything about real estate, don't even own their own house. They're like, I want to do a full rehab. I'm like, do you really know all that's entailed? Um, that's just so much money and, and risky for you and your investor who's partnering with you if you have a partner. But in the timeline, I mean, man, those fees sure add up. I'm curious too how it's going for you because right now with the Rona and all of that, everyone's staying at home. Everyone and their mother are fixing up their homes. So contractors have had their best years ever. This is going to be their best year ever. Last year was their best year ever as far as sales. So we're trying to get some stuff work done at our house that we're trying to finally have someone else do it besides us all the time. They told us it'd be four months before they could help us with our gazebo in the backyard by our pool. I'm like, four months? Come back to me in four months? Like, you've got to be kidding me. And so I'm curious, like, are you finding that it's taken a long, you know, are you long lead times on things or anything? Yeah, not so much in terms of labor, but in terms of getting materials. Yeah. So one of the things we're doing with this property is fully putting all new windows throughout the whole property. And we wanted a specific line of windows. And the contractor came back to us and said it was going to be about eight to 12 weeks before we could get the windows. And I'm like, that's not going to work for a burr. We need to get out of this hard money quick so that we can refinance and get it rented out. And so thankfully, it just kind of happened to work out was they had a slightly lower quality set of windows. I take that back. It was actually a higher quality window. They actually had it in stock and they were able, they're going to be able to do it much, much sooner. So thankfully it's actually going to work out. But yeah, we did, we did run into that. And everything else is relatively minor and doesn't really need much materials. It's maybe some fencing here and there, some landscaping, paint, that type of stuff that's not really super material intensive. But but yeah, we did run into that. We're running into the exact problem with windows. So not only do we have to fix our gazebo because it's falling over. We're also redoing our kitchen, like I said, for the first time. And that means we have, we're incorporating the nook area into the kitchen as well. So we have to raise the window up and extend it out. And that's on the exterior wall. So we have to buy a special order window. So we ordered it from Lumber, or not Lumber Liquids, Window Liquidators online, Geldwin Windows, decent middle of the road, 8 to 12 weeks, just like you said. So we're not going to get our windows until March or April. So I just sold a house recently. And I bought another one. And the one I bought it from, he owned it as a rental, but he was a developer. And him and I were talking, you know, talking shop as we were going through the transaction. He was telling me as a developer, he's he can't get anything. You know, he can't, you know, he's all these people want to build houses. And he's like, you know, I'll build you a house. It's gonna be twice as expensive this year as it would have been last year. And it's gonna take twice as long because I can't get the materials. Yeah, we're trying to fix our gazebo, like I said, and we want a cedar post in the front and they're nowhere to be found. 
So it's like, okay, well, we're going to have to use pressure treated or just kind of wait. So there's materials are lacking. We had the electric company come take out a tree because they could do it for free. It was in so many feet. They mowed over our fence. So now we have to put in a new fence. I'm like, great. So we'll be waiting for uh, Lowe's spring Black Friday to go buy some fence posts and hopefully they'll be in stock. <laughs> yeah. And, and going back to the burr, one of the things that I really like about it is it just absolutely, you know, obviously getting as much of your money back as you can or being into deals for as little as possible is great. But what I like about it too is that it really amplifies your return numbers because if you're getting $500 a month, say, which is amazing cash flow, but just say you're getting $500 a month. And if you put $20,000 down, that's one return. Whereas if you put $5,000 down, that's a totally different return. So that's why I'm so excited about the Burr is because we're getting into the deal with such a little capital down, but also because it's just going to amplify our return numbers. Yeah. I do feel like last year, I wouldn't say I would be comfortable recommending Burr because of the economy. Who knew what was happening? But now now you can anticipate at least for the next six months. So it's a great time to Burr. It's a great time to flip. Prices are still going up incredibly fast. And interest rates are still historically low. I mean, there really is no better time to take the risk and buy something and give it a shot. I was worried about the the economy and the market, just like you mentioned. But the reason I was able to pull the, the trigger is because the property didn't have to be burned. Somebody was living there when I bought it. It was a homeowner. They lived there. It was fine. If we really wanted to, we could move a renter in as it was. So if we go to burr this and it didn't work or you know whatever the case may be, the market tanks, we could sell it as is, or we could even rent it as is. And so we had multiple exit strategies. Having exit strategies is, is really important. I agree with you. So we saw a massive upside, you know, hey, we can burr this ideally, or worst case, we just turn it into a regular traditional rental and deal with that later. It scares me when people say, oh, I'm going to go buy, you know, Boise, Idaho has been booming, right? 30% increase year over year last year for housing prices. And people have asked me, oh, well, I want to go buy there for equity. I want to just buy a house because it's going to go up. And I'm like, no, if you want cash flow putting a renter in there, please do not take a negative cash flow property just because you're banking on appreciation. That is so risky. There is the only exit strategy you have then is to sell it. And there's a lot of issues with that as well. So always having multiple ways out of a real estate situation is good, whether you can rent it out, sell it, or lease option or whatever. There's got to be more than one way that a property makes sense to buy it. Where did you go after your first deal? Well, we buy all of them in Memphis because why not? We live here and it's one of the best real estate markets in the country. So (laughs) no need to go anywhere else. It was in a C-class neighborhood and it was... Most of our houses have been under 100,000. We bought one that was 120, but now we're looking at houses 170 and 180 because that's just how it is. But with the low interest rates, we're still cash flowing the same, so it's okay. But the second property needed needed a lot of work, but we just cleaned it up and made it safe and rented it out. And we're like, "You know what? When the tenant first tenant moves out, we'll do a full rehab then." So, she's still there and whenever she moves out, we'll do a full rehab. Now, our last house that we did, we spent the most we've ever spent. We spent probably, I don't know, I say 15,000, but I know I'm missing a few thousand dollars there in rehab costs, but we do all the work ourselves. So I can't imagine if we would have hired that out, it probably would have been a 25, easily $30,000 job. But we remodeled the kitchen. It was a two bedroom house. We turned it into a three bedroom house. We added a deck on the back and we put a new toilet in. We did leave one of the vanities, one we had to replace in the bathroom, ceiling fans, paint everything, new baseboards and all of that. So it took a while. But it was definitely worth it. We bought that one in 2000, end of 2019 for 120. And that one's worth now at least 175. And I mean, just in like a year or so, it's been ridiculous. The market has just blown up. I owned a, a duplex, half of a duplex, and I bought it for about 145, 150. And just a year and a half, two years later, it was sold it for 235. Isn't that crazy? It was crazy. We had 32 showings in two days. We received three offers in the first 12 hours of it being listed. Two of them were over $20,000 over asking price, sight unseen with no inspections. Like It's a crazy market. So I want to kind of dovetail that into a piece of advice for everybody listening. And the reason for this is because I get asked this question a lot is whether I should buy right now or not. And I think the answer is yes, but it has to be a good deal. And I think it's always a good time to buy as long as the numbers make sense. So I think it might not be the perfect time. Maybe you can get a property a little bit cheaper if you wait, but timing the market's impossible. So if you can find a property that has good numbers, it makes sense today. 
I would personally still buy it. I'm still buying. I've done three deals in the last month. So I'm putting my money where my mouth is and still buying deals. I agree. Especially if you think, okay, so if you're going to wait, well, when are you going to wait? You're going to wait till next year, wait till the year after? Like, when are you going to wait till before you finally say, oh, forget it, let's just buy something? Because the opportunity cost right there is huge. If a tenant pays you $1,000 a month, so okay, you overpaid 10000 for a property. Well, in 10 months of rent payments, you've already got that back. Plus, you've got an appreciation. Plus, your tenant's paying your loan down. Plus, your tenant's paying your property taxes and all your repairs and all that. So, so what if you overpay a little bit? In the long run, it won't really be overpaying. And the opportunity cost of you waiting for some market crash when you won't be able to compete anyway if you're not going to be an all-cash investor or have your ducks in the row and be ready to pounce and not be afraid, it's just kind of waiting to stop sitting on your thumbs and just do it. You know, If you look at the housing market over a period of time from the 1930s to the 40s to the 50s, all the way up till now, housing prices ever gone down and stayed down? It's like, no! Housing prices always increase over time. So if you're in it for buy and hold and you're making positive cash flow every month, it's okay, in my opinion, if you overpay a little bit because it's going to be a moot point in a few years anyway. Yeah, I think the positive cash flow is the important part if you're a rental investor. That is the point. That is the number one factor. You can essentially pay anything as long as it's cash flowing. In, in my opinion, as long as the cash flow return numbers are good, you can pay anything. That can open a can of worms for so many things. People often ask me, are you mad that you're paying PMI or this or that? Because there are some properties that I've gotten into like through a house hack that I didn't put 20% down, so I have PMI. And, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it does, it does suck to have to write a check for $200, $250 every month for PMI. But you know what? I'm still cash flowing $1,000 a month on this property and I wanted to put 3.5% down plus appreciation. So no, it's not great to pay PMI, but the numbers still make sense. So I'm going to do it. And that's kind of how I feel about the market today. And you mentioned opportunity cost and Years ago, 2016, 2015, 2017, I was trying to time the market. I thought I could. I was like, I got to wait. You know, We're eight to 10 years past this last crash. It's coming. So I'm going to wait. And I waited and I waited and I waited and the time never came. And I was talking to Brandon Turner and some other people at Bigger Pockets. And you know, he gave me the advice of, if you're not going to buy today, you're not going to buy when the market crashes because then you're going to be nervous then that everything's going on. And if you're not willing to buy now, you're not going to be willing to buy when everything there's blood in the streets. And that really just changed my mind in how I approach things. And I hope that everybody listening to the show will take that same advice. I agree. I've been, that's exactly the thing I just said. Don't sit on your thumbs and just do it. If you can't do it now, you won't be doing it later either. What does your portfolio look like today? You have did those first two deals. And where are you at today? How many houses, units, cash flow? What does that all look like? We're not one of those people that have a million units. We're really particular in the houses we buy because my point is that I want less risk and less issues and I want more cash flow. So all of our properties cash flow four to 500 or more and we manage them ourselves each month. And so we have six houses, five are rentals. We didn't buy any last year because again, I was worried about coronavirus and the election and where the market was headed. So I wanted to be sure of my strategy on how I would buy properties or where I'd buy them. And so we've got some catching up to do this year. So we've got our cash, we've got our HELOC too. So hopefully we can get a couple this year because I was upset we didn't get two last year. (laughs) I would say I agree with you. And, you know, I often think that, you know, I don't ask the unit numbers to say that you have to have a thousand or or five. You know, either one is it depends on the person. Everything's gonna be right for somebody. I think the number of units is often a vanity metric because you know there's people that own thousands and thousands of units, but they only own 0.1% of those thousand units. So their cash flow is different than you who owns 100% of, of these deals potentially, and your cash flow could be higher. So I actually take a very similar approach to you is you know I want to scale, but I also want to have high cash flow. And my business partner said, why don't we buy this one? This one's super high cash flow. And I said, no, look at the area. I said, I don't want to buy in that area. We have a great portfolio of single family houses. We have great tenant base, strong cash flow. And you know, a lot of people poo-poo buying single family. And I, I get it, but then again, you know, apartments, you get a different clientele, a different tenant base. Whereas with a single family, we're getting super high quality tenants. We're not having any issues with paying knock on wood. And for me, it's just a super high cash flow, low stress, low risk thing that I love. You are speaking my language. Oh my gosh, you, we are the same. Exactly. I don't want to do any work. After I have my tenant in place, I want to feel so safe and secure in my investment and my tenant. And I don't want to have to worry if they're going to make payment or they're going to try and get one over on me. 
I invest in B-class hires and C-class neighborhoods. We do the safe way, 20% down. And I know with the Burr method, you know, you can leave the 20% in there as well. But I would love fixing up houses, but I don't want to get burnt out doing it either. I want to continually love it. Like when I did my craft thing on Etsy, I don't really like doing crafts as much anymore because it was so much work. So it kind of took away a lot of the joy. So for real estate, I know that if I try and get sucked into this new uh, Burr method thing, that's going to be a lot of work for me and my husband after work on the weekends, him coming home late because he goes to the house. We've been there. And it's like, I don't know if I want to, it sounds, it's alluring, but I like ones that are more cosmetic and don't need a ton of work. I want to buy it. I want to fix it up quickly. If it needs fixing, put a 10 in and just stop thinking about it. I want an easy street. I want to play with my kids on the weekends and not have to worry about tenant issues and stuff like that. Has this always been your philosophy or has it kind of changed over time? It's always been my philosophy. Yeah. So that's interesting to me because for me, it's changed. You know, when I first got into real estate, I was, I'm going to own a thousand units. Like that's, that's what I want to do. I want to buy these big apartment buildings and I want to own a thousand, two thousand, five thousand units. And then I did my first deal and I'm like, maybe, maybe that's not what I want. Maybe I want a little bit more time with higher cash flow per unit and, and per house and less stress. And, you know, I don't spend any time on the rentals, less than two hours a month, I'd say on average, if that. How does it get better than that, right? We can, it's a little bit slower, but we'll, we'll scale and we'll maybe own 10, 20, 30 of these eventually. High cash flow, low time intensive, and low risk, and also get the appreciation of single family houses. I know. And the great part is, is since your tenants are paying everything for you, it's going to be so much faster to pay off the properties. I mean, I've got into let's leverage everything we have until the day I die. We'll probably never refinance any of our rentals ever. We'll just, the more properties you have, the more cash you're able to save quicker, especially with your regular job and normal saving habits. And so theoretically, we could buy a property every five to six months if we wanted to with 20% down plus having extra rehab costs. And the more properties you have, the quicker you're able to resave for your down payment. And when you realize that, wow, after so many years, matter of fact, I just checked the balance of one of my properties the other day. It's like, oh, I only owe $40,000 on this house. So if I just pay this off, I get an extra 400 a month because I'm not paying the bank principal and interest? Hmm. <laughs> you mean I don't need to put any more money down, but I can make an extra 400 a month. I just got to pay off my loan. It's tempting to do that. you know. So it's like, okay, well, sooner than later, you're going to have more money than you know what to do with. You'll be able to pay off your properties, have 100% of all your cash flow minus interest, I mean, minus insurance and taxes, all of that you get to keep. And to me, then you're like, yes, look at all this. You know, if my rent's a thousand dollars and I'm paying, let's see, sixty on insurance, and I'm paying, I don't know, I don't know what property tax would be, maybe a hundred bucks a month towards property tax, you're gonna get to keep seven or eight hundred a month of that tenant's rent in your pocket. And that's the goal. You just need to have 10 to 15 fully paid off properties. You'll make over a hundred thousand a year in passive income. And you can do it by just one property at a time. Yeah, it starts slowly, but it starts to spiral and that was kind of what my business partner and I realized recently. We, we look back, we haven't taken a dollar out of, our, out of the rentals yet. We've kept every single dollar in the business. He works a corporate job. I was working a corporate job. I actually just quit. But before that, we hadn't touched any of it and we were going to buy another property. And we look back at our bank account for our rentals and we're like, we don't even need to take anything out of our pocket. We can just take it out of the cash flow that all of the other rentals have already created and we can just continue to buy this. Next year, we could probably do it again and again and again. And before we know that, you know, because we were starting to think, do we need to bring in investors to really scale? And it's looking like we might not even need, we might bring in a couple here and there just to kind of accelerate it. We're both young, but we don't need to if we don't want to. And that's so cool. People think, you know, you've got a, it's a unicorn ideal to have all this money or it takes so much work or you have to have all these extra investors and use hard money, this and that. But it's like, really, just start off with one, then get the next one. And before you know it, you're being able to save at such a rapid rate that you can buy the properties yourself and you don't have to worry about depending upon other people to help you for financing. I mean, besides the bank, you know, you want the 30 year loan for sure. Yeah, absolutely. When you think back on your life, it could be personal, business, real estate, whatever it may be. What's a piece of advice that you've received that still impacts you to this day that you could give to people listening to the show? It's actually something that my husband has drilled into me. Well, he tried, he's been trying to drill it into me for my whole life. I've known him forever. And he says, get out of your own way. You're the only one holding you back. You, just you. You're your own problem. Nobody else is holding you back. It's you. 
And he has said that forever. And when I, you know, when I was struggling in real estate in 2007, he was saying that to me, get out of your own way. You're better than you think you are. Stop holding yourself back. And I say that now with my new coaching business and, you know, getting out there on Instagram, which has been a challenge for me because I'm 38 years old and I was not really a social media person. That's not my thing. So to be out there was getting out of my comfort zone. So it's just like, I'm the only one holding me back from any type of success, me, not anybody else. It's no one else's fault. So my advice is for those of you out there who are wanting to do anything in your life, whether it's you want a completely different job or you want to get out of a relationship or you want to buy your first rental property or whatever, you're the only one holding you back, nobody else. So just believe in yourself, realize that you only have one life to live. Just go do it. Who cares? Just do it. Casey, thank you so much for joining me on the show. For everyone listening that wants to connect with you and chat more about real estate, where's the best place for them to go? Absolutely. I would love to chat with anyone. I am on Instagram daily, Brick by Brick Wealth. And also they can find me on my website, brickbybrickwealth.com. The username is very applicable to the slow and steady house by house strategy that we just talked about. I'll put a link to all your resources in the show notes below so anybody interested can go ahead and check those out there. Casey, thanks so much. Thank you so much. I had a great time. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.